Hello, everyone. So I'm going to be giving the first part of two talks on quantum computing. Uh, I am currently a second year graduate student at the University of Chicago under Frederick Chong. Um, the second part of the talk will be given by Yunong Shi, who's also a graduate student of Fred's. Um, this talk's going to serve several purposes. Um, my part is, part is going to be fairly introductory, so we're going to cover like the basics of quantum computing um, and walk through a basic quantum computing algorithm. Um, and part of this will include distinguishing classical and quantum information and how one might go about programming an actual quantum device to do something that's useful. Uh, so the outline, so it's part one because part two will be Yunong. Um, there are three major parts uh, for my section of the talk. The first one is why quantum computing at all? What can we possibly do with it? Uh, I'm going to briefly explain the state of quantum computing today, like how many qubits we have, what sort of computations we can hope to accomplish in the near term, and provide an overview of where we'd like to be in order to co uh, compute interesting things, things we've all heard about, such as Shor's algorithm or maybe Grover's search. These are things that are beyond what's simulatable on uh, classical current supercomputers. Uh, as part of this, I'll give a good candidate, uh, a bunch of criteria for what makes a good candidate problem for a quantum computer. Uh, the second part is I'm going to give a basic introduction about quantum information and how it's distinguished from classical information. I'm going to give the fundamental units of quantum computing, which are these qubits, and how we can manipulate them. Uh, this will provide an insight into why quantum computing won't be simulatable uh, in the long term on a classical device. Finally, I'm going to give uh, a basic quantum algorithm, which provides speed up over any classical known algorithm. This is the hidden bit string problem, or bernstein vazirani uh, in solving this problem, we'll get insight as to where the actual power of quantum computing comes from. Uh, so why quantum uh, computing? Uh, fundamentally, fundamentally, it's an interesting problem because it's the only known paradigm where we can possibly get exponential speed up over any classical algorithm. Furthermore, it's the only technology which scales exponentially. So as we add more objects to our system, we get an exponential increase in size uh, in terms of like search space. Uh, there's potential for quantum computing to solve intractable problems in chemistry, simulation, and optimization. Uh, and Moore's law is slowing down, and quantum computing is possibly here to save the day. Uh, in particular, there's specific applications where uh, we want to scale, we want to keep scaling up, but we're becoming less and less able to do so. But quantum computing may scale further than what we can classically. Finally, we can have this healthy competition between quantum algorithms and classical algorithms. Uh, namely in things like chemistry or cryptography. Um, there's a lot of algorithms that are so-called quantum inspired in that classicalists will take uh, quantum known algorithms and try to use the, the, the techniques that they discover to make their classical algorithms better. So this helps both things progress at the same rate, basically. Um, so what's the current state of quantum computing? This is, we're in an era called NISC, which is noisy intermediate scale quantum computing, uh, where we have about tens to hundreds of qubits. The error rates are moderate, so we can't expect to accomplish too many gates on these qubits. Um, and we have limited connectivity. There's a lot of people in industry that are trying to build scalable quantum machines, such as IBM, who has about 20 accessible on the cloud qubits, Rigetti, who has about 20 superconducting qubits, and Google, who announced, I think last year, or maybe two years ago, about 72 qubits on their bristlecone machine. Uh, other technologies, such as ion trap machines, are trying to boast over 100 qubits, such as INQ. However, these devices all uh, have limited connectivity or moderate errors and no error correction, which is uh, important. With these limitations, uh, we can't compute all the things that we'd hope to do, such as these big uh, famous problems. Uh, even though we have the machines, we still have uh, the problem that the algorithms we want to solve aren't able to be, uh, have, demand a lot more resources than we actually have available. For example, as we can see in this graph, where we have on the y-axis the year and the y-axis the number of qubits that we have available. So as we saw in 1995, we had barely one uh, operational qubit. Uh, and as of like 2015, we had about 50 qubits. And as we saw before, uh, in order to get the error rates down, we sort of scaled ba back on the number of qubits we have to about 20 or so to get our error rates down. But we can see that the, the algorithms we want to solve, such as Grover's algorithm for database search or Shor's algorithm for integer factorization, require a lot more qubits than we have available on the order of 10,000 to a million qubits. And these are usually error-corrected qubits or logical qubits, so it's a lot more physical qubits per logic. Um, uh, in contrast, we can see that we've made a lot of progress in the last 25 years, but we're still far away from where we want to be. There's this big gap between where we are and where we want to be. Uh, so we're still years away from where 
we can actually compute these hard problems. In the meantime, what algorithms can we do on the devices we have? Some of these algorithms include QAOA, quantum approximate optimization algorithms, quantum chemistry algorithms, such as variational quantum eigensolvers, which fall into a class of algorithms called variational algorithms, where we can classically manipulate a set of parameters and use a quantum computer to query the outcome of our uh, selection. This also points to a set of hybrid quantum classical algorithms where quantum computers are essentially used as a coprocessor to solve a small piece of the total computation. This type of, type of algorithm is basically a heuristic that we can use with our smaller devices. Uh, even though these algorithms aren't quite, quite where we want them to be, the gap still persists and uh, there are a lot of research challenges which Yunong is gonna address later that we can uh, hopefully close that gap a lot faster. It's this idea of co-design where we sort of integrate the whole hardware stack and software stack to sort of uh, improve what we can do. So for example, there might be more efficient ways of using the bits we have available or being able to accomplish more gates on the bits we already have to push the frontier of what we can do. Uh, this means that we can close the gap much faster and hopefully in the next you know, five to 10 years we can accomplish a lot more. Uh, so in the near term we expect device errors to be pretty significant, so on the order of like 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus five, and these error rates are really limiting in what we can accomplish on our, on our machine. In the news, we usually hear about how many qubits we have. Like I showed earlier on the slide, we had several industry players who had, we, I showed the number of qubits they had and not the error rates that they were, uh, were displaying. But the error rate is actually really significant in what, how many operations we can do. So for example, if we look at this space-time product, which is the number of qubits and the time is the number of operations we can do per qubit, uh, we can either do maybe 1,024 operations on a single qubit, or we could do one operation on 1,024 qubits, or anywhere in between, or such as 32 operations on 32 qubits. If we, if we lower the error rate maybe to 10 to the minus five, so in the previous one we had 10 to the minus three, if we can get that uh, 100 times better, then we can get a lot more operations on a lot more qubits. So we can actually, we increase the quantum volume and so the more, that's more we can do with our quantum machine. So what makes a good candidate to solve with a quantum computer? So the first is we want a compact representation, i.e. we don't need a lot of, we don't want to use a lot of memory to store the, in, the inputs to our program. Uh, similarly, we want to have a, high, a highly compact output, meaning that what, we, what the program produces is almost the same amount of data that it took as input. Um, similarly, we don't want to have to do a lot of I.O., meaning we'd have to stop our computation somewhere through, input more data. We want to sort of set up the whole problem beforehand, solve the problem, and then read the output. Uh, there should, however, be a lot of choices to make. It's AK, so we have a problem where we have a lot of different paths we might explore to find the correct solution to an optimization problem, for example. This is a highly complex problem. Uh, third, we want an easily verifiable solution, meaning that when I get the answer out of my quantum machine, I should be able to look at what I get and see is that the actual correct answer. So if I'm factoring a number, if I get a factor out, I should be able to check that it is actually a factor of the number that I input. Um, in the near term, we typically run thousands of shots. We, we run the program thousands of times and collect an output distribution of the answers that the quantum, quantum computer is giving because we have errors. What we want is that the, the correct answer comes out with the highest probability and we use that as what we call the correct answer of the, of the machine. Uh, fourth, we might use problems that have a lot of hard subproblems. So we could query a quantum computer with a small piece of our whole classical algorithm and get an output that the classical algorithm could then use. Um, finally, or we could use a problem which we could map to many different types of quantum algorithms. So we could use a VQE as part of it or a QAOA as a sub-piece uh, and map our whole computation to many of these different known pieces. Okay, so that was sort of like the why quantum computing and there's still a lot of work to be done. Yunang will sort of discuss the paths that we've taken so far to improve what we can do. I'm now gonna give an introduction to the basics of quantum computing. Uh, specifically the things that will pertain to a concrete example that we can do at the end. So first let's give, begin with a single qubit. In general, we're gonna be agnostic to what type of technology we're running on. So before I showed superconducting qubit numbers, but this could be an ion, it could be uh, a trapped ion or anything else that you could use to implement a qubit. Um, a qubit, just like a typical classical bit, can be in the zero or one state. So for example, here we have a qubit that's pointing, we have this arrow pointing north into the north pole, which is the zero state, and an arrow pointing down to the south, which is the one state. 
This, this visualization that we're using is called the block sphere, which helps us visualize where the state is in a, in a two-dimensional space. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but suffice it to say that the, the, where the arrow points on the sphere is def fully defining the state of the, of the qubit. Uh, these are both well-defined and very reliable states. So I can prepare thousands of these, and I can measure them all on my quantum device, and 100% of the time, I'll get what I prepare. So if I make 1,000 of the zero state, and I measure it, I'll always get a zero back out. Um, so, but that's, those are not the only valid quantum states. Any point on these spheres are valid quantum states for a single qubit. For example, I can have the zero plus one state, so it's in a superposition between the zero and the one. So notice that it's on the axis halfway between zero and one. If I prepare this state, a thousand of them, and I measure them exactly, roughly, with error, 50% of them will come out as zeros, and 50% will come out as ones. So what happens if, uh, oh, that's, I did that. <laughs> so that's exactly what this says. We can, we can, when we try to look at the state, so we can't, we don't usually look at our states in quantum computing, but when we do look at them, we expect it to collapse back into one of these bases, zero or one states. Um, this is one of the, the most important or amazing things about quantum mechanics, is that even though I did the exact same thing to prepare that zero plus one state, uh, the process I did was deterministic, that is, uh, it can still result in a non-deterministic output. So if I only measured it once, I would have 50% chance to get the zero or one state. So even though I did the same thing, I still have a, a probabilistic chance to get something different. There's still, still something random. The randomness is not, however, due to the machine that I'm using. It's actually a fundamental thing of nature. Um, we can have multiple qubits, so we don't have to just have one. We could have multiple qubits all prepared in different states. So these amplitudes, as you can notice, can be complex, they can be negative, or they can be positive. And the fact that they can have different phases is really important to actually solving quantum algorithms. So if we take all those three qubits together, we actually don't just have six basis states, we now have eight. So we have all of the, the different combinations, uh, all the bit strings of zero to one as our basis states. Uh, and the coefficients, are this A through H, basically correspond to the probabilities of observing a certain state. So this G in the one, one, zero state directly relates to the probability of me measuring in the output a 1, 1, 0. So we have eight basis states. This is, hint, this is gonna hint as to why it's impossible, or rather very, very hard, to simulate on a quantum computer. If we tried to keep track of all of these states, we would run out of space. <laughs> um, so with three qubits, we had eight coefficients. Uh, and in general, if we have n qubits, we'll have two to the n different coefficients we need to keep track of. Together, this is gonna be called this principle of superposition meaning that a quantum system can be in a superposition of any of the basis states. So here I have eight basis states, I have a superposition of all eight with all these coefficients. Now, what if we convert this to just some other kind of bit, a probabilistic bit, um, and is there actually something quantum going on? So if I have a probabilistic, a single probabilistic bit, I have uh, these coefficients A and B, which directly relate to the, uh, the probability of me observing a zero or one. However, if I add a second, uh, probabilistic bit, now C and D, these are, these are independent. These probabilities of observing zero and one for the second bit is completely independent of the probabilities of measuring zero or one for the first uh, bit. This extends in general, so as we increase the number of probabilistic bits, we only increase by exactly two coefficients each time, so we have a polynomial increase in the number of coefficients we need to keep track of to simulate this system. In contrast, if I have a quantum bit, I have those two coefficients, A and B again, for the states zero and one, but as, as I add a second bit, I now have four coefficients to keep track of, A, B, C, and D. And, and if I go further, I have eight uh, coefficients. And in general, this will scale two to the n coefficients. So this is the process, uh, or this is the property called entanglement, meaning that there's some sort of shared information between the bits. Um, and in general, you cannot separate a quantum state to its component bits. So like, as we saw before, the, the classical bits, we could separate them out into each of the individual probabilities, but here I can't do that. The probabilities of me observing certain things may be uh, directly tied to observing states, uh, other qubit states. Um, so there's some shared information going on. If we wanted to, keep, to track a general quantum system, we need to keep track of all two to the n coefficients, and that's really expensive. So how can we represent and manipulate this information? As we saw, we had those eight coefficients. So we can think of this as a vector in two to the n dimensional space. So for example, for our three qubit system again, we have those eight coefficients. Um, we can't really visualize it, but we're gonna use this one qubit to sort of visualize 
um, our state in eight dimensional space. Uh, but, so just sort of bear with me. It's, it's pointing somewhere in this eight dimensional space. So what happens if we wanna move this vector around? As you can see in the diagram, we move, started at the green state, and then we moved around the sphere to this new red state. So how can we do that? So we can apply these matrices to this vector to accomplish the state. So this is a really big matrix uh, that just accomplishes some rotation in that eight dimensional space. And the whole game becomes applying the right matrix to our, to our state to do something meaningful. So that when we measure it at the end, we actually get a result that we expect. If we wanted to build a device, however, we don't wanna just do matrix multiplication, that's kind of expensive. So instead, we can apply these quantum gates. Uh, in fact, we only need single and two qubit gates uh, to do this. So, for example, so here we have the quantum circuit model where on the left we have Q1, Q, uh, Q0, Q1, and Q2, all initialized to some uh, input state, in this case all zeros. And then we apply a series of gates where time flows from left to right. So the first gate we apply is this zero, U0, and then we apply an X to the third qubit, et cetera. Uh, so importantly, we only ever need single and two qubit gates to be universal for quantum computation. So we can always do local operations in order to achieve something global. Um, so what are these, we're gonna look at some example gates and we'll see how they manipulate um, a small set of qubits and then we'll be able to use these operations to do uh, our example um, algorithm at the end. So the first one we're looking at is the Hadamard gate. So if we take an input state of zero and we apply a Hadamard gate, then we obtain a superposition of the zero and one state. In fact, we get zero plus one. And so we can see that it's in superposition because if we measure it, with 50% likelihood we get zero and with 50% likelihood we get one. We can apply Hadamard to multiple qubits, uh, creating an even superposition of all four basis states for two qubits. Here we have even superposition of zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So we have equal likelihood of observing any of the four basis states. Uh, and again, if we have three, we get an equal superposition of all eight basis states. Um, so what happens if we apply a Hadamard to a zero? We obtain that zero and one as we saw, with, so they're equal superposition. And if we apply the Hadamard again, we return to the zero state, meaning that H is its own inverse. So if we apply it, we should expect to get back what we put in. Um, However, if we apply it to the one state, we get something sort of different. So we obtain the zero minus one state. So we still have equal likelihood of observing the zero state and equal likelihood of observing the one state if we measured it. However, we have a phase on this one. And that phase is gonna be very important for the bernstein vazirani algorithm that we'll do later. If we apply H again, we still obtain one afterwards. So we should remember that zero minus one with an H applied to it returns us to one state. Uh, the other gate that we'll need is the controlled not gate. So we can think of this as like a quantum if statement. So we're going to apply, we're going to flip the coefficients of the target bit, the second bit with that weird uh, plus sign. We're gonna flip the coefficients if and only if the input bit or the control bit is in the one state. So in the first case, we have controlling on a zero, so nothing happens. The input state or the, the target state remains the same. Zero or A zero B one becomes A zero B one. However, if the control is one, then when we apply the C not gate, we'll flip the coefficients. So zero, A zero plus B one will become B zero plus A one. <coughs> so finally, we can look at an algorithm. So here we're gonna explore the bernstein vazirani algorithm or the hidden bit string problem. Uh, the algorithm is the first one to de demonstrate quantum advantage, meaning that it's faster than any classical algorithm, algorithm can do. So what exactly is this problem? Suppose we have some secret encoded bit string for example, 1101, and the only way for us to interact with this bit string is to send our, bit, our own bit string that we'll come up with, that we'll make up, x to an oracle. The oracle is going to take our input, x, and interact it with the, bit, the hidden bit string in some way, and return us a single bit of output. So how would we solve this classically? How many queries would we need to recover all n bits of the hidden secret? We would need to do this n times. So for example, we could input the, the strings one and then a bunch of zeros to obtain the first bits, the first string or the first bit of the hidden string. We could obtain the second bit by doing zero, one, and then all zeros, et cetera. So why is this? We have n bits of information of the hidden bit string, uh, but we're only allowed to recover one bit at a time. So we'd have to do, to get all n bits of information, we need to input, do this n times. 
However, with a quantum algorithm, we can do this with exactly one query to the algorithm or to the, to the oracle. How is this possible? So first, uh, how do we implement the, an oracle classically versus how we implement it qu uh, quantum on a quantum machine? So classically, we simply take a function, which is a single input bit string x, and returns s dot x. So we get a single bit out. However, this, this, we can't do that same oracle on a quantum machine because every operation on a quantum device must be reversible. So as we saw with the classical oracle, we put in bits in, and we only got one bit out. We can't do that with a qu uh, quantum machine. However, any irreversible operation, for example, that dot product operation, can be made reversible without too much overhead by adding extra bits. So we can modify the classical oracle uh, by adding a temporary bit, this TMP, um, which allows us to make the whole oracle reversible. So this is the or oracle that we're going to use for our algorithm. The oracle can be treated as a black box, but first let's sort of open that box and see how we would implement it if we were the ones making up the bit string. So, in fact, this oracle is just a pattern of C naughts based on the bit string. So, for example, if I had the bit string 0, 1, 0, 1, then I'd put a C naught wherever there's a 1, where we have the least significant bit being this top bit, this x0, and the most significant bit being uh, x3 at the bottom. So, here we had two 1s in our hidden bit string, so we put two C naughts controlling on x0 and x3, all targeting the temporary bit. Oh, I guess it's a little, it's a little off shifted here. That, that's on the bottom. Um, so again, for another example, if we had uh, s equals 1, 1, 1, 1, then we would have a C naught on every input bit, all targeting the temporary bit. Uh, so, so one last trick that we need to talk about is phase kickback. Um, and it's probably the most important thing, and so let's look at what it looks like. So suppose we apply a layer of Hadamards to our two input bits, 0 and 1. So what is the state after we apply these two Hadamards? So we put in zero plus, so we put in zero and one, and we obtain zero plus one tensored with zero minus one. And if we sort of factor that out, we get zero, zero, minus zero, one, plus one, zero, minus one, one. So now we're going to apply C naught with control on the, the first bit and targeting the second bit. And so what happens? So the rule for the C naught was if the first bit is one, then we flip the second bit. So this turns into 0, 0, minus 0, 1, minus 1, 0, plus 1, 1. And we can factor that again and to get 0, minus 1 tensored with 0, minus 1. So they both now have that minus 1 in contrast to the initial state or the, after the first layer of Hadamard's where we had a plus. So we can see that the first bit acquired the phase of the second bit. So what happens if we apply Hadamard's again to both of these bits? Uh, if we recall before, 0, minus 1 after Hadamard becomes 1. So in fact, we obtained ones in both of those states. So what happened? We had, we had a phase on the second bit. We sort of kicked it back with the C naught to the first bit. And then when we applied Hadamard's again, we actually obtained something different. So now we can put it all together and find the final solution to our problem. Um, so first, we have a bunch of inputs, uh, Q0, Q3, and we have that temporary bit. For our case, you can think of all those Q0s as zeros and the temporary as, as a zero as well, this X gate is gonna flip a zero to a one. So we could think of it as having all of our input bits being zeros and our temporary bit being in the one state. We apply Hadamard's to each of these to obtain the zero plus ones for all the input bits and the zero minus one for the, tar uh, for the temporary target bit. Then we apply the oracle, which if we recall is just a pattern of C naughts, and then we apply Hadamard's again. So all those C naughts are going to apply the phase kickback to each of the input bits um, whenever there's a C naught. So if I have a, a control on any of these uh, input bits, then it's going to become a one state after all of these H's, meaning we'll know where the C naughts were, meaning we'll know what the input or the hidden string was. So this, these last things are these measurements, these little um, operators we put after each of the H, and we put them onto these classical bits at the end. The double wire means that it's a classical output. So as we can see that I see the output 1011, that means that there were the input or the hidden string was exactly 1011. So we did this all with a single query to the oracle, uh, and, uh, while the classical needed all n queries to it. It would have needed four queries. Okay, so why did this algorithm work? For a classical oracle, we only needed to send, we were only able to send a single bit string at a time, 
In the quantum setting, we were able to create a superposition of all of the possible input bit strings and send them all at once. But it's more than that. There's more structure to this problem, and which we can exploit using the qubits. In fact, specifically the phase. As we noticed, the thing we actually used was the phase kickback operation. These phases can encode information that we can't encode classically. Okay, so that's gonna uh, end my portion of the talk, but I'm gonna review what we talked about, uh, and then Yunong will take over. I was a little fast, but I hope Yunong can cover me. <laughs> um, so first we talked about sort of what the current state of quantum computing is, and what we can do versus what we'd like to do, and sort of the, the path towards getting there, and Yunong will talk more about that. Uh, we reviewed the basics of quantum information, specifically what are qubits, um, how we can represent them, how we can view, visualize them, um, and how we can manipulate them. And we've distinguished uh, quantum information processing from classical information processing. And then we explored this concrete example, the bernstein vazirani example, which provides quantum advantage, um, meaning we can do it faster than any classical known algorithm. Okay, that concludes my section of the talk. Uh, and now Yunong's gonna take over for me. Uh, I guess I can take questions, yeah. I got a quick question. How does that like, gate error or error rate connect to this particular example? Right, okay, so if I had, if I had error rates on, on all the operations I was doing, then instead of getting exactly 101 on our example here, instead of getting exactly 1011, we get a probability distribution over all the possible states, so all the two to the four states. With, with we, if with the low, error rate is low enough, we'd expect that the correct answer appears with really high probability. So we'd be able to distinguish it from all the wrong answers. Yeah. So, you, yeah, so in general, we'll do this thousands of times and get a full distribution and then look at the, the highest output. Yeah. Why must uh, the quantum algorithm be reversible? Um, so because it's, we don't want to uh, use up any of our energy, so it needs to be, I guess, adiabatic. We can't, we don't, all the things we do, we need to be able to undo, so we don't lose any energy by doing the computation. Okay, thank you. Thank you.